I'm Brian Hall. Welcome to CE Wire 2019. I'll be discussing ocular manifestations of systemic diseases. I have no disclosures. The eyes are the windows of the soul. This quote is very old and its origin is not very clear. There's debate over the origins of the phrase and it's been attributed to Shakespeare, to Leonardo da Vinci, and even the Bible. Just like its origin, the meaning is not clear either, and it's open to some fairly broad interpretation. However, we hear a variation of this almost daily, phrased as the following question. Doctor, what can you tell me by looking into my eyes? As we all know, there are numerous systemic diseases with ocular manifestations, and oftentimes it's the ocular symptoms that first drive the patient to seek care. Therefore, we're on the front line of encountering, diagnosing, treating, and coordinating the systemic care of our patients. I've put together several cases of the patients I've seen that presented first with ocular findings due to a previously undiagnosed systemic disease. First case is a 44-year-old white male came in complaining of increased blur when reading. He had an eye exam approximately three weeks ago, and he said he was told that he had severe sun damage and he needed prescription sunglasses that he told me were very expensive, and he felt that they were just pushing a sale on him. His prior history was unremarkable. Medically, he had rosacea, for which he was taking doxycycline 50 milligrams by mouth daily. His visual acuity without correction was 2030 and 2040 and corrected down to a perfect 2020 with a low hyperopic prescription. His pupils, EOMs, and confrontations were normal. His slit lamp examination showed nasal pinguecula in both eyes but was otherwise unremarkable, so I'm not sure if this was the severe UV damage that he had been told about. Pressures were 16 in both eyes, and here's his dilated fundus examination. These are stereoscopic photographs of his right optic nerve and his left optic nerve. So if you're able to cross your eyes and fuse these pictures on your screen, you'll see that he has very subtle chronic optic nerve edema. If you were to be seeing these pictures live, you would see that there was no spontaneous venous pulsation. So what are we thinking? Well, he has bilateral optic disc edema. He's young, he's not overweight, and he's male. So most likely, this could be associated to his doxycycline. However, anytime there's bilateral optic nerve swelling, you do need to, spe to rule out a space-occupying lesion, as well as other infectious or inflammatory etiologies. I advised him to discontinue his doxycycline, and I ordered blood work, complete blood cell count with differential, metabolic panel, sed rate, CRP, Lyme antibodies and Western blot, syphilis antibodies and RPR, as well as a quantifuron goal to rule out tuberculosis. I ordered an MRI of his brain in orbits with and without contrast, and I asked him to come back for a 30-2 visual field. Here's his MRI, and it was unremarkable per the radiology report, but if you look down in the area, he has an empty cella. An empty cella shows does not mean that he does not have a pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is soft and squishy like a sponge, so when there is elevated intracranial pressure or a history of elevated intracranial pressure, the pituitary gland gets squished down into the cella and you can't see it. That is definitely indicative that he has or had elevated intracranial pressure. Here is visual fields with scattered nonspecific defects, none of which are neurologic. So based on all this, I think his issue is most likely related to his doxycycline. Now, intracranial hypertension has been associated with multiple drugs in the tetracycline classes, including minocycline and doxycycline. And the thought is that it affects cyclic adenosine monophosphate at the arachnoid granulations, which interferes with the energy-dependent absorption of cerebral spinal fluid. Now, the time to develop intracranial hypertension is not known, and it can take any place from two weeks to one year. 
Interestingly, the raised intracranial pressure lasts for about two to five weeks after discontinuing the tetracycline. This is interesting because the half-life of even minocycline, which is the longest acting tetracycline, is less than 24 hours. Now, some patients with intracranial hypertension are asymptomatic, but the vast majority of people complain, come in complaining of headaches. Other complaints are transient vision loss, double vision. The reason for this is that the elevation in pressure dis slightly displaces the brain within the, within the skull, and the sixth cranial nerve is tethered where it leaves the brain stem and where it enters Dorello's canal. This causes compression at the area of the clivus and a secondary nerve palsy. So patients can report that, uh, ringing in their ears as well as nausea. Their nerves can be swollen with no spontaneous venous pulsation and various visual field defects. Now, the presence of a spontaneous venous pulsation does not mean that there is no elevation in intracranial pressure, and it's and its absence does not mean that it is elevated. However, if you are concerned about an optic nerve and you do see a spontaneous venous pulsation, it does make you feel a little bit better. Okay, medications that are associated with this include vitamin A, tetracycline, oral contraceptives, naldixic acid, lithium growth hormone, tamoxifen, as well as sulfa drugs. So just right back to my patient. So he discontinued his, te, uh, his doxycycline, his optic nerve edema resolved, and he has had no further issues. Next case. 34-year-old female came in complaining of intermittent episodes of red eyes with the last occurrence of happening approximately two months ago. This was her first eye examination. Her medical history was positive for a history of a positive PPD with a normal chest x-ray. Her acuities were 20-20 and she had a low hyperopic prescription. Her extraocular motilities were full, confrontations were full, and pupils were normal. Pressures were 11 and 12, and here are her anterior segments. If you look here, she in her right eye, she has what appears to be a old scarred flictanule. This, the, the scarring was in her anterior stroma. And on the left eye, you see a small flictanule-like scar at about 3.30, and then another one over at 9.00. So it appeared to me that she had large inactive flectanules, and if you remember, she had a history of a positive PPD. Now, classically, when we hear flectanules, we think tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is the most common cause, or a very common cause, but in the United States, the most common cause of a flectanule is Staph aureus. Okay. If there is no evidence of eyelid margin disease, you do have to rule out tuberculosis. And then if those are normal, you also have to rule out herpes simplex as well as chlamydia. As those are two things that can also cause this sort of reaction. We wrote her a prescription for her glasses for use as needed and asked for her to come back in four weeks. At her follow-up visit, she reports that she had developed a sore on her lower left eyelid for the past two days. Everything else was stable. And if you look here, you'll see a small herpes simplex vesicle in the lower left lid margin. I think this photograph is great because you see the, the, the vesicle there as well as the scar down flectanule very, very in close proximity. Her chest x-ray was negative. Her blood work was negative for chlamydia antibodies. She was positive for HSV type 1 and type 2. Elevated IgM levels show that this was likely a more recent infection, and it was very, very elevated, greater than 5. Again, most people will have some antibodies circling, in particular to herpes simplex virus type 1, but when we check the blood work, we're not only looking for the presence of antibodies, but how elevated are they? And in both these cases, it was elevated so high we couldn't even measure it. So I prescribed acyclovir, 400 milligrams, five times a day for seven days. 
The herpes simplex virus is the most common virus in humans, and over 90% of us are infected by the age of 15. Herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2 share almost all but 50% of their DNA, and they behave very, very similarly. The primary difference between the two is where they like to establish latency. Type 1 likes to establish latency in our trigeminal ganglion, which is why we see more signs, more herpes simplex type 1, because that affects the eye. Type 2 is more likely to establish latency in the sacral ganglion, which is why it's more likely to cause recurrent genital disease. Herpes simplex can be treated topically with a variety of antiviral agents. Okay, trifluoridine uh, is used uh, every two hours for a max of nine times a day for up to 10 days, then every four hours for another seven days. And this is pregnancy category C. Now, if we quickly review the pregnancy categories, category A means there is well-documented studies and evidence that there's no risk to the fetus. Aside from non-preserved artificial tears and prenatal vitamins, I'm not sure what you're going to find that falls into this category. Category B is there are no human studies, but there's well-controlled animal studies that show that there is no risk to the fetus. Category C is that there are some animal studies suggesting there may be risk to a fetus, but no human studies, and the benefits could outweigh the risk. And this is where most medications we use fall into. Category D shows that there is a definite risk to the fetus. However, the benefits could still outweigh the risks. And then category X is absolutely dangerous to the fetus and should be avoided at all costs. And again, trifluoridine, category C. I'll get to that in a moment as to why I'm bringing this up. Okay, Vera A is an ointment, not commercially available anymore, but you can get it from some compounding pharmacies. And then Xergan, or Gancyclovir gel, was approved in 2009, which is used approximately five times a day until the ulcer heals, then three times a day for seven days. This is also category C. Antiviral agents... Are, are very effective in treating herpetic eye disease. In fact, all herpetic eye disease can be treated orally. It is important to keep in mind that the cornea is avascular, so it takes up to 72 hours for the ant oral antiviral to build up therapeutic values in your tears and in the cornea. So you may want to consider supplementing with a topical agent for at least the first 72 hours. But thereafter, all herpetic eye disease can be treated orally. Anything deeper than, than the endothelium needs to be treated with oral agents. Now, the initial drug that was studied was a cyclovir. At the time of the herpetic eye disease studies, that was the only available antiviral medication. And what you'll see is along the top of each one of these drugs, I have it in bold. That's what's given for eye disease. And the other two medications, I have it written in italics because Again, a cyclovir was the one that was studied for in the herpetic eye disease studies. At that time, basically, the use, or even now, the use of oral antiviral agents in the treatment of eye disease is considered an off-label use of the medication. Now, the thinking was, when we were treating herpes simplex, is that it is a more fragile virus than herpes zoster. So 50% of the herpes zoster dose was given to treat simplex. So that makes it really easy. You would use 800 milligrams five times a day to treat herpes zoster. Therefore, to treat an eye infection, 400 milligrams was used five times a day. After the development of other antiviral agents such as valacyclovir and famcyclovir, the FDA studied it and approved the drug to be used for at differing dosage from zoster to simplex. It's not just a simple 50% reduction. However, for eye care, we continue to do the same thing. So for Valtrex, the treatment for herpes zoster is one gram three times a day for seven to 10 days. So for eye disease, we use 50% of that. 
500 milligrams three times a day for seven to 10 days. Although if you were to look it up in a physician desk reference for which it is FDA approved in the treatment of genital disease, it's actually 1000 milligrams twice a day. So I found this to be helpful because it can be very confusing when you're trying to consult the physician desk reference and things about what you should be dosing for herpetic eye disease. Now, back to acyclovir, just to point out, all these drugs are category B. So the knee-jerk reaction is if you have a pregnant female who comes in with herpetic eye disease, you may want to treat her topically because you feel like it's a little less invasive.